My name is Anna Howland. I am a marriage and family therapist, a psychotherapist in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, I'm in private practice and I see individuals, um, adolescents and adults and couples in my practice. Um, I guess I sort of have a specialty. I work with trauma and I work with a lot of creative people um, of all stripes, you know, whatever that, that means to folks. And it means so many things really. Um, but yeah, those are probably my two kind of main um, focuses. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so one of the reasons I reached out to you is because I've been interviewing a lot of chiropractors and a lot of chiropractors who uh, use the same approach that I do in practice. And so as different as we all are, and we are pretty different, there is a consistent theme of kind of how we address this issue of being um, particularly sensitive to energy and to other people's stuff. And what I was wondering is how, well, thinking it would be to have a non-chiropractor chime in on what it means to be an empath, what it means to be particularly sensitive, and um, and how do you have professional advice, guidance, practical insight as to how people can best negotiate or navigate what it means to be super sensitive in particularly right now in this absolutely randomly insane context yeah. where I feel like even the most insensitive person is just already firing um, hard. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so I know that's a lot to unpack. So, um, well, we can take a stab at it and see where we land. Um, yeah. But, you know, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's very easy to be flooded, particularly one on one contact, you know, if especially what you do, putting your hands on people. I mean, that's sort of, you know, immediate conduction of, of information. So, you know, what I tell my supervisees and what I work on, and I think it's a practice and you have to sort of keep chipping away at it. And it's a, you know, it's dynamic and it, you'll be better at it sometimes and not great at it other times, you know, through trial and error, I think each individual human being has to sort of find the resources that 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 help them, that soothe them, you know, um, whatever that means. Exercise is a great thing, whatever that looks like to you, whether that's a yoga practice or a running practice or whatever. Um, that's a fantastic way to get that excess energy out of the nervous system and to sort of siphon it off. Um, you know, also if it's outside the fresh air and sunshine and all those things, which are so good for our psyche and our soul and our body. And, you know, it, it's, it depends on, on how sensitive you are, what type of sensitive you are, what, you know, what you're sensitive to. Um, certain things are going to electrify you in ways that other things aren't, you know, some, you know, somebody might come in with a big grief process that they're in the middle of, and that might not whammy you. But if somebody comes in with a big shock trauma, that might whammy you, you know, it's sort of, it also, I think, as a therapist, I say, uh, know thyself, go to therapy, you know, know, know where your triggers are and what whammies you. But also, <laughs> it's not, you, their, their feelings aren't your problem. Okay, right? this, this is really important because this is yeah. going to be the nut of, um, this is going to be the nut for a lot of people. So I'm going to interject a little bit if I can. Um, the the type of work that I don't know if you how much you remember about when we did our sessions together, but for me, I consider what I do to be non therapeutic. 
-hmm. in that it doesn't really matter to me what you're going through is exactly what you said. It is not my job to fix it. My job is to create the space and follow your system's desire to release whatever it's holding on to and to, you know, push the buttons where it's ready to let go. And sometimes that can elicit uh, a grief response. Sometimes it can elicit uh, sneezing. Sometimes it can elicit falling asleep. Sometimes it can just be the most, you know, warm, fuzzy feeling ever. But all of that is aside and apart from me. And I think that I, I would be interesting. My, I'm guessing that for your people that you are training, most of the people got into the type of work that you do because they want to help people. And that is certainly true for most of the people that I have in my seminars is that they're, they're guided and driven by their desire to serve. And so it can be very confusing that they're not there to actually fix the person. And it's tempting. It's tempting to want to make somebody's stuff go away. So how important is it for people to go through their own process and not be, you know, fixed by whoever's interacting with them? Well, I would say um, if you were my supervisee, I would say, why do you need to fix them? And what does that mean? You know, because I, they're in pain. Sure. Because, you know, because they're uncomfortable. Right. Yes. And, and, and I can feel alongside and I can be with the suffering, but um, I don't actually know what their ideal, their optimal self looks or feels like. That's not, that's not actually up to me. And I certainly don't, I don't want that authority. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I have no divine information that tells me what, what an ideal should or shouldn't be. That's smacks a little bit too much of moralistic type thinking to me. And it gets a little, a little gray area. And so for me, it's about helping somebody know themselves, helping somebody have their own experience and, and think about their own experience on their own. It's not up to me to make it make meaning for them. It's, they have to make their own meaning. And okay, so let me stop you for a second. You talked about, uh, you said something like, I can be with them in their grieving process. Is that what mm -hmm. you said? In their suffering, yeah. In their suffering, okay, perfect. So how do you, how do you, Anna, do that without feeling depleted by that? Well, I do feel depleted by it, of course. You know, it's, it's, it's work. Um, and that's what all of the other resources and practices in my life are for is to give me enough of sort of a, a base, you know, the juice to be able to do hard, you know, the heavy lifting, you know, same as somebody who, who does manual labor would need to make sure they have enough fuel to do that. I have to have enough fuel to do the sort of emotional mental work that I do. That having been said, I also um, work really hard not to take it on and had, especially early on in my career, had some pretty uh, startling experiences of really getting, uh, I, I mean, whammied. I've really got knocked out by some pretty intense, you know, feelings, you know, and, and experience. Okay, I'm going to interrupt you again, because um, a lot of the people that are going to be listening to this are not native English speakers. So can you just uh, explain what you mean by getting whammied? Yeah, being flooded, being, being, um, being sort of um, overwhelmed, being uh, really um, stunned by the intensity and the amount of, of feeling. And 
And it's not always predictable. We don't always know. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm asking how their day went and suddenly there's an enormous outpouring of feeling that's happening and like, whoa, you know, really, you could drown in it if you let yourself. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know. This happens at the, we call it the, the doorknob moment. Often um, right at the end of a session, usually like at the end of the hour is like, they'll tell you something that they've never told anybody before, or they'll all of a sudden they'll start crying extra hard. You know, leaving is hard when they're in a place where they feel safe, where they are, where they're feeling cared for, it's hard to want to leave that. And there's a, there's a, I think a subconscious process to sort of stretch out the time that they get to have with us. And, you know, really simple questions like, you know, saying, saying, reflecting back to them, like, wow, there's so much here. There's so much going on for you. What are you going to do with the rest of your day to take care of yourself? Mm -hmm you're separating yourself from them not in a in a in a aggressive callous or uncaring mm -hmm. way but also like you know you're, you're helping them think about how to take care of themselves which is often something that people really are lacking um and and you're signaling to them that you know that that you're at the end of the time and you know but you're also honoring that there's a lot going on for them and you're recognizing it. So you're sort of, you kind of, you want to sort of tick the boxes. Wow. There's a lot happening here. Gosh, I, I see that there's so much feeling that you're having, or it seems like what, you know, you can sort of experiment with what feels good to you to say in terms of reflecting back that there's a lot of feeling and, um, and a lot of intensity. And then you ask them, something about, you know, what does the rest of your day look like? How are you going to take care of yourself? What are some things you can do to soothe yourself as you go throughout your day? Or what are, you know, what are some of your resources or practices that you can lean on today? You know, or simple things like just make sure you're good to yourself today, you know, or, you know, pay attention to yourself today and let yourself, you know, do what you need really kind of simple things like that to, again, to, to keep yourself separate from their process a little bit, you know, um, and, and also still honor that there's something really important happening because of course, you know, we didn't, none of us got into this work to, to make people feel worse. None of us want our, our clients or patients to walk out of our office feeling, you know, L less good that's that's definitely not <laughs> not the goal well, at all it's not the goal but it's also kind of inevitable sometimes because you still got to go through that and um, yeah and i think you know these these are this is when i lean on little things that mentors and colleagues have said to me over the years you know i, I will say to people things like well sometimes we have to come apart to come together yeah or you know um <laughs> with although it's funny like depending on the person that's sometimes not true you know it's like mm -hmm. work with trauma i say to them if you start to feel worse, if you have more symptoms, I want to know right away because it's true when that when you're dealing with like PTSD kind of trauma, if the symptoms are getting more intense, that's not good, <laughs> you know, where people who have less severe stuff going on, having a little uptick in symptoms is okay. Um, as as long as we're kind of keeping our eyes on it. So It's so unique. I mean, at, when I was thinking about talking to you and I was thinking about this problem, I, I was thinking about how, what, a, what an enormous task you've undertaken, this idea of 
how to set good boundaries for ourselves, how not to take things on. It's so individual. It's so everyone has a different process. I think in one of your interviews, somebody was saying that they meditate for three or four hours a day. And I thought, boy, if the whole world could meditate for three or four hours a day, if we all had that ability, boy, that would really change the world. Um, but, you know, I, this is my business. I work a full, you know, a full week. I don't have three or four hours a day to, to meditate. So I cheat. You know, I try to eat really good food, a lot of greens. I try to get outside. I try to laugh a lot. Um, I mean, COVID makes things challenging, not but I, I, yeah, it's not as funny. And but I get together with friends and you know have meals together and go for long walks together and you know things like that. But you know. <laughs> it's 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 an extra challenge in these in these times for sure you know Yeah. So when I think about like highly sensitive or empath, I'm thinking about kind of two different channels. I'm thinking about the nervous system and the body um, are, do they just have an instrument that's more available for some reason, you know, or is it that there's, um, is there a, um, like a, a psychodynamic, a, like a, a historical reason. Um, mm -hmm. So, I find often people who are highly sensitive are people who grew up in really challenging households. There was a lot of stuff going on, whether it was in their culture or in their home or whatever, that there's often a reason that they became so vigilant. Um, and so there's that kind of, so there's that kind of end of that spectrum. And then there's folks who, for whatever reason, and just have a more sensitive instrument. You know, they have a more a highly tuned, you know, fine tuned instrument. So I think sort of discovering which is which is important. Um, you know, one has more of a psychological and one has more of a biological um, starting point. And then, then you can think about what things would, um, uh, what which, which what things might be more helpful to whatever kind of end of the that that sensitive spectrum that you're on, um, but also, you know, even though you know you don't think of what you do as therapeutic, it 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 is healing work, and you are. Um, more attuned than others, probably than the average person, you know, because of the nature of what you do. It's how you know where to put your hands. It's how you feel directed when you're, you know, mm -hmm. some of it is your is your intellectual pursuit and that cultivation, and some of that is this sort of un unknowable knowing, ineffable. Yeah, and and it's that that's very uh it's very real and you know and we have to be kind to ourselves about it so i mean again when you're not putting your hands on people when you're not working with people you have to be doing everything you can to fill the well to you know so to speak to to mm. restore yourself to 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 bring you know to to water the to water the the ground um and to make sure that it's staying you know full of nutrients, you know, get, get good sleep, go, you know, go to church if that's your thing, whatever. It doesn't, it doesn't matter really what right. it is, you know, uh, like ha have more sex. I don't know, but like, <laughs> you know, 
um, but do these things that bring you peace and joy and comfort um, and make sure that it's a good mix between downtime, quiet time, reading novels, meditating, that, that sort of thing. And also, you know, going dancing and ha having dinner with friends and, you know, so it's, I wish there was a simple formula. Yeah, it would be great. I would love that. Um, but it really is trial and error and it's, and, and it's dynamic. It's always changing. Um, as we, as we age, as our lives change, as we move to different places, as our practice, you know, sometimes my practice is way more full of um, sort of low maintenance type folks who don't have a lot of really intense. Stuff. And then other times it's like, <laughs> holy cow, did you guys get together to make sure that it was all happening at once? Like, is this a core? <laughs> yeah, um, so, yeah, so, so. Again, it, 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 it's about, you have to turn that, that empathic, highly sensitive muscle inward on yourself um, and make sure that you are feeding, feeding the, the needs there. Yeah, I mean, of course it's tempting to want to um, to want to, to do everything that you can sense and feel, right? It's like, I see it. I know it's here. I know I can be helpful, you know, <laughs> exactly. Um, woo! and fun, you know, um, and, and of course, and it feels good to see the people we work with get better. I mean, w wow. It's, a, it's a living miracle that you're getting to witness and to, to take part in and, of course, there's a little bit of like a, you know, this the sort of addict or like the the the, yeah, the kid on Christmas morning, like ah, you know. Um, so I think we have to we have to be watching that tendency in us because it's not that's not that's not for them that we're doing that. That's not service. That's for our own. That's for our own needs. And so are we asking them to meet our needs in this way? Um, and so that's something to sort of keep your, keep your eyes out for, you know? That's really good. And how, like, what are the questions that we could ask ourselves to kind of check in and be like, uh, yeah, this is inappropriate. Yeah. Well, who is, who am I doing this for? You know, I, I, I ask my supervisees all the time, I ask them, what would you have to feel if you didn't say this thing or if you didn't do this thing? What what would be the feeling that you would be left with? And and often my in my you know, I know it's a different paradigm, but in but in therapy, often the reason that we're saying something or doing something with a, a person that we're working with is because there's a feeling in the room that is so difficult to sit with that we're trying to fix it so that the feeling goes away. And that's not actually healing. That's just evacuating the feeling. We're just sort yeah. of, it's just like a, you know, like a, a garbage chute in a spaceship or something. We're just sucking it out into the void. It's not actually becoming integrated or being used or, or changed in some way. It's just being avoided. So I think that's a useful thing to, to sort of wonder is what do I, what do I, if I don't say this or if I don't do this, what am I left feeling? And sometimes we're left feeling incompetent or, you know, um, somehow insufficient or, you know, not, not good enough. And those are not, you know, the other way, I, the way I think about therapy is that often what's in the room is not my, those aren't my feelings. Those are feelings that they're processing. They're working with their own sense of not being able to be enough or not measuring up or, you know, being incompetent. And so it's filling the room and I'm feeling it as the sensitive person in the room as the other. And so it's really about sidestepping that, right? Like, so again, 
when we go to our own therapy, when we have our own spiritual practices, we're able to separate ourselves a little bit and say, is this mine? Is this theirs? Whose is this? So we don't, we're not acting out of our own anxiety to get rid of the feeling. Mm -hmm. um, feelings, I hear people talk about positive and negative feelings. That's not a thing. <laughs> Feelings aren't negative. They're just feelings. There's no, there's no value. Um, there are feelings that are unpleasant <laughs> for sure. And there are feelings that are nice to have. Absolutely. But it's not a negative feeling. And I, often we're trying to avoid feeling something unpleasant. So I think also um, really coming to terms with that there's nothing you know, there's no negative feeling. It's only unpleasant. And if we can learn to sort of expand our tolerance for unpleasant feelings, that can also be very helpful. Again, a person has come to you because they have a feeling that things can be different. There's some kind of knowing in them that things can be different than they, than they currently are. And they know that they cannot do it by themselves. That does not then make it your problem. It's still their own. They've still hired you to help them. So I think also remembering, I mean, I think it's just about, I keep doing this with my hands as I'm talking to you, but I think it's really about remembering that I'm not in charge of everything. I'm not the same, I'm not the same as you. I'm separate from you. And there's so much beauty in coming together with another person in all the ways that we can. Uh, and there's a lot of beauty in separateness and in individuality. Now I sound like a real American. Be an individual. But, um, but, but it's so, so, so important for your emotional health um, to remember um, that, that you are your own. You are your own entity, your own being. Yeah. Uh, how do you deal with somebody who, when they walk in the room, you just feel like they suck the life force out of it? Do you try and... I mean, do you have boundaries in your practice where you're like, yep, yeah, um, this person is going to require too much from me and I'm just, I'd, I'd rather pass it off to someone else? Absolutely. Are you there I, yet? Yeah, there's a lot of burnout in psychotherapy. I would imagine there's a lot of burnout in what you do as well. Um, and I think some of that is because, you know, we take on clients that we should not take on. Um, and I am a firm believer in taking care of yourself this way. I am not everyone's therapist. I'm not everyone's cup of tea. And that's perfect because there's so many other folks that they can go to who are going to be exactly right for them. And it's way more important to me that somebody find the right psychotherapist for them than that I am the their psychotherapist. Like, I don't have to feel about that. I want them to find the right practitioner for them. And, and also I want to have the right clients for me so that my days are right. feel expansive and fun and joyous and interesting and all of that. So I think absolutely, you know, if you get a hit in that first phone call or contact that there are going to be more than you want to deal with or whatever, you know, it's great. It's, really important to have a, a whole referral system so that you can refer to other folks, you know, like, yep. oh, this person is not for me, but you know, so-and-so would be a fantastic fit. Um, I think that's really, really important. And it's not always like throwing somebody under the bus, you know what I mean? <laughs> no. That's why I was laughing. <laughs> You know, like I, um, one of the things I like to work with is something called thought disorders, which is sort of more psychotic processes in, in people's thinking. 
I love working with that. I don't find it overwhelming. There are a lot of people who do find that very overwhelming. And so they'll get that person to call and they'll think, oh, no, this is too much for me. But, you know, Anna is actually, this is her. She likes this. She likes this kind of patient. She likes this kind of work. That's great. You know, it's like we are we are who we are and really owning your strengths and owning your weaknesses um, or your places where you're not interested for whatever reason is so important and knowing what you have capacity for at a given time in your life maybe there's more going on so you need you need folks who have less going on for them whatever uh, it's so important to stay to attuned to yourself and what you what you what you're interested in and what you can tolerate if you if somebody comes in for a first session and i don't think that we're a good match Often they will agree with me. Often when we get to the end mm-hmm. of the hour, I will say something like, you know, um, I'm not sure that I'm the best therapist for you. Um, you know, and then we'll, uh, we'll talk about it. Are you, do you have other therapists that you're going to see? You know, wh- how did you feel this hour went? You know, and I'll explore that with them usually a little bit. And often, if I don't feel like we're a good fit, they they agree, you know, yeah. or they'll say, oh, no, I liked it. And then I'll get an email three or four days later that's like, oh, well, I, I think about it. Yeah, exactly. And and but I think you can also just say to a person, if you, if you meet them, if that feels like more emotional work than you want to do, um, you know because our paradigms are so different. Um, If that feels like more emotional work than you want to do, I would imagine you could say something like, don't have the kind of availability that I would like to have in order to work with you. So here's the name of a couple of colleagues of mine who I think might have time and space and be a good fit for you. You know, you don't have to get into, you don't have to spill your guts. You don't have to tell them everything that's on your mind. You can, again, this is another sort of way of being boundaried and staying separate you know, is, you know, it's been great meeting you. If that's true, it might not be true. But, you know, I appreciate you coming in. Um, and I think the work that you are going to need is is a little bit beyond my capacity right now. And or I don't think I have the kind of availability that I, I think you're really going to need. You can say things like that, that are about their care, because it is also mm-hmm care they don't need to know that you're doing it for you too um and you can frame it so that it's for them there's a lot going on here you have you know your system has a lot of you know there's a lot of elements here in your in in what i think you're going to need for healing so i'm i actually think that so and so would be a better fit for you and what you're needing right now you know very simple and um very very um and also very boundaried they don't need to know that you're having a big emotional response to them um, and feeling quite overwhelmed. They, that's, you know, that's not, that's not their business, frankly. Um, And so you, you know, you keep it, you keep it separate again, you keep it separate. So this is interesting. I feel like you're the first person that has talked about boundaries as a, type of separation which when I think about it it's like of course that's what they are Um, and I wonder if the resistance to boundaries in the people that I know is that we tend to focus so much on our interconnectedness Um, and in the end it's it's both you know it's not good and bad it's not here or there it's yes, we are totally interconnected. And this is where right now in this process or in this moment or in this relationship, this is where I stop and you start and um, you're responsible for you and I'm responsible for me. And, And there's something very clean and honoring about that. And also, this is something that I'm just thinking about right now is the more generous we are with our boundaries which you know we're not taught that boundaries are generous at least i wasn't taught that boundaries are generous um we are modeling that behavior for the people on the table who most often probably need that type of help in understanding 
um, that their their energetic kind of neediness is a little bit um, well, it's going to create issues for them in different settings, not just absolutely. on the table. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you can't connect with something if you aren't separate from it. Mm -hmm. There, there, there's no there. You can't bridge something if you're already if you're the same. There's no need mm -hmm. to. bridge. So I think you're right. It is both. And um, and I do think boundaries. I mean, we in in the therapy world we talk about the notion of modeling quite a bit you know we model for our clients when we are taking good care of ourselves we are modeling for the people that we work with how to take care of themselves just in an, just by that by itself doing doing nothing else so when we it is it is part of the healing process to say to someone there's a lot going on here and i don't think i'm the best practitioner for you it's powerful to see someone acknowledge what's true for them. Mm -hmm. That's a powerful experience. And, and I think a healing experience, they might not like it. They might not be, they might not be warm and generous when they hear you say, I'm, I'm, I can't work with you, but it still will have an impact. And I think, you know, we also are so, addicted to the instant gratification of seeing change happen. And often a, a colleague was telling me recently, <laughs> I was being funny, but I was lamenting. I had said something really smart to a client and it didn't, it like, <laughs> and I was like, it was so brilliant. And they, she didn't acknowledge how brilliant I was. You know? And, um, and my, my, my colleague said, you know, I was walking down the street the other day and I suddenly thought of something that one of my first therapists ever said to me about 25 years ago. And it occurred to me, finally, oh, that's what, <laughs> that's what, and I was like, no, 25 years, I have to wait 25 years for this person to acknowledge my brilliance. This is terrible. Um, Stick around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think also, you know, these things, my experience on your table uh, many years ago was was that sort of rippling out. I would have the experience on the table and then in the rest of my day and my week sometimes, I would go, whoa, okay, whoa, okay, that's in a new, that's, mo that's moving differently. That's, and I think we have to trust that that is absolutely how things work it's there's an element of mystery there etc so i think also we have to we also have to separate ourselves from that like feel good thing that we all you know get to experience sometimes sometimes the impact is immediate but sometimes it's a long ways down the road and you know we are interconnected. We are resonating with one another all the time. Um, but we're not the same. And, you know, a, a symphony, you know, an orchestra can make a symphony because there are so many different instruments, all making slightly different tones and sounds. And it's coordinated. And it's, and it's, you know, there's, there's method. But those instruments, it's not all the viola, you know, there's all the strings, all the winds, all the brass, all the, you know, percussion, it's all of it. So I think also being really clear that, um, that, that sameness and interconnectedness are not, the, they're not the same. They're not, they're not equivalent. Yeah. Nice. I mean, it's the self-care, you know, it's such a buzzword now, um, which is too bad, I think, because mm -hmm. it's essential. I mean, how do I care for myself? You know, the same as if you were 
you know, a new, a new parent to a baby and you look for the things that that baby needs to, to calm her when she's, you know, when she's gassy or when she's hungry or when she's, there's, there's all these sort of idiosyncratic, very individual things that we all need that, that, that make us feel better, that soothe us. And, you know, it, they will, those, those needs will, will change over time. And, you know, but I, I do think using your sensitivity that is usually turned outward and bringing it inward toward the self. I, I think, I think that's the way a highly sensitive person or a person who identifies as an empath um, can really use their innate gift in service of themselves and in, in service of, of, you know, longevity in their career. It's very interesting. I've noticed that, um, oh, I don't like this part because it makes me sound really old, but the people that I, consider my colleagues in terms of how long we've been in practice. Um, there's been this concept of service and the service was very much outwardly acknowledged, you know, serve, 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 serve. The more people you serve, the more you're serving humanity. And the, the self-care awareness um, as much as I can intellectually understand its value, there is a part of it that triggers me like, oh, that feels so self-indulgent. And so it's very interesting because you are the fifth or sixth person that I've interviewed and basically the fifth or sixth person who has talked about how important this concept of self-care is. And that if, you know, if we are not nourishing our, not only our basic needs, but our emotional needs, our nutritional needs, our needs for being outside, for doing things that fill us up in every way that there's, that you can't give from a depleted cup. So, um, <clears throat> So I'm, I'm starting to hear it. Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful book um, called Pleasure Activism. Um, there's a, she's a, she's a, a BLM uh, African-American woman. I think she's from Detroit originally. Her name's Adrienne Marie Brown. She has a podcast also um, with her sister and, um, and she, and she talks about how important um, doing w what you can do and, and taking care of yourself simultaneously. If you've only got 10% to give, well, give 10%. And if you need 90% of your time to be filling the well, great, because then that means that for that 10%, you're really going to be, pretty, yeah, you're a hundred percent there, even if it's only for 10% of the time. And, um, and, and she actually, pulls the self-care movement back to the Black Panthers, which is actually where this concept really originated, which was, listen, we're in this for the long haul and we have got to take good care of ourselves. And, you know, if we're going to make it to the end of this incredibly long, uh, this incredibly long uh, piece of work that we're doing here, we, we have to make sure that we, we have the stamina for it, you know. I think it can be self-indulgent, you know, it can be very, you know, appropriative. It can be very surface. It can be, you know, the sort of the, the, I think it can be ugly self-care when it's done in that way. But I, if it's done with intention, if it's done with, um, in a connected way, you know, to self and to other, then, uh, then I think self-care in that way is modeling. It is therapeutic. It is service. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah. It's both, you know, it's both like many things. It's more than one thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good. 
Can you think of anything that's just one thing? Uh, nope. <laughs> I, yeah, it's just, right? that's just how the paradigm works. Yeah, there's nothing that's just one thing. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to think I'm, about that this whole week. What, yeah, is there anything that's just one thing? Yeah, we want to simplify. Freud called it splitting. We want to simplify. We want it to be all good or all bad. That would be so, wouldn't that be so easy? Oh, it'd be so simple. <laughs> but it's complex. And actually, you know, we need to be looking at, we need to be making things as, letting them be as complicated as they are, rather than trying to oversimplify and reduce yeah. You know, reductivism is correct. It's bad. It's bad for for an ecosystem. It's bad for the spirit. It's bad for uh, relationships. Yeah, it's bad. <laughs> there, so, something. Uh, it's, there's something. There's something bad. There's something. <laughs> just one thing. Um, tell me the difference between splitting and separation? Well, splitting is the idea that something is all one thing. So splitting is about, is about, um, well, splitting is like what you see in, in, in politics in the world today, particularly in the United States, because that's where I live. But it's like, they're all good, or they're all bad. And that's it. Um, there's no complexity, there's no nuance, nothing. And separation is, is simply acknowledging that we are different, um, that, that you are your own being with your own thoughts, feelings, experiences, and history. And so am I. Um, and that there's no value judgment on that. You're not, you're not all good or all bad. You're a, an imperfect, a perfectly imperfect human being. So someone who's coming from a significant trauma background in the different ways that that can show up in, in a person's history, I would imagine and I, I don't have to be right about this, but I would imagine that the sensitivity would be uh, a person's sensitivity or a person's dysregulation would come up in specific around certain triggers, right? So like if someone comes from a background where, you know, a, a parent was psychologically or physically abusive, there may be um, a, a propensity for sort of caution, cautiously moving around, you know, feelings, somebody's loudness. They might be particularly sensitive around loud patients or something like that. I don't know. Um, whereas a person who has more of a biological kind of systemic sensitivity might just it might just be all big feeling whether it's loud or quiet or anything it might mm -hmm. you know so i think just being aware like oh this person might be difficult for me to work with because they are allowed a loud talker or mm -hmm. um, or or i don't know or their 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 physical body resembles a person who was very difficult in my background um you know size wise or the way they move or the way they use their hands or whatever mm. and so i think you it, it gives you insight into what might be difficult what might be tricky for you to work with um or what might create more intensity in your own responses so you can keep your you can keep yourself keep you know keep your eyes peeled for it you can you can be on the lookout for those kinds of things and it doesn't necessarily mean anything about whether or not you'd be willing to work with those those um people um but it, it gives you more insight around when you're having a big response in the moment uh, when the person is in the room with you um 
And it may, you know, if you think, oh, today I've got this person and that person and this person coming in. And two out of those three people are, you know, trigger me in some way. Well, then you know that that's a day that you really need to be on top of whatever resourcing you use, whether that means the music in the office is your favorite or you're wearing your most favorite lipstick or you've eaten a really good breakfast or you have a very fun thing planned for the end of your work day or whatever. But it's a way you can prepare yourself. You can think ahead and prepare yourself um, or reward yourself um, in whatever way feels appropriate to you, you know? Um, and so I think, I don't know, maybe am I making an argument that it's better to be sort of historically, uh, like have a historical element? I, maybe. Um, but I didn't feel that. Okay, or I didn't good. hear that. I, I think it makes it easier to collect the data and track what's what's more troubling and less troubling to you in the, in terms of the, the overwhelm. Um, whereas a person who, I think you have to do a little bit more sort of data collection if you're, if you just have a highly sensitive system, you have to do a little bit more um, detective work around what are the things that, that really uh, upset my system what are the what what is the material that comes up in the room that really that really you know kind of um, um, off off balances me? Yeah, it's good. Resources like books or podcasts or anything that you might throw out for people. Um, I think uh, Adrian Marie Brown, her book, Pleasure Activism, is a wonderful resource. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I know you're asking about specifically like boundaries and self-care and things like that. I'm sure there are some really good ones, but I would actually say if podcasts are something that you really enjoy, go find some favorite podcasts, whether they're comedy or true sure. crime or... <laughs> whatever, and use that um, as, as your self-care. Healing work and effort and hard work doesn't have to be um, without pleasure. Yeah, I love that idea. Yeah, that's great. That is really beautiful. Although yeah. I have to say, I feel like most of the people who will probably be attracted to listening to this are really good at finding pleasure and having fun. Oh, for a good, good group like that. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And that's a gift. I, mean, well, I, think that's, I think that is also, um, I think, I think that helps make the world a better place. People who know how to have fun and who are, you know, who are in service, you know, so yes i think when people started playing fun music in their office everything changed uh-huh it was like yay i get to go to my office and put on whatever playlist i want instead yeah. of uh, i gotta go to the quiet office <laughs> it just changed everything yeah 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 <laughs> I, I mean music is just so it's so powerful what a powerful medium you know, holy moly. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Anna, thank you so much for spending this uh, rainy Saturday morning in San Francisco with us. And um, I really appreciate your insight and your generosity of time and spirit. And for me, just being able to bask in your beautiful presence has been a real treat and it's so nice to reconnect with you. It's been way too long, but it feels like it was yesterday. So I'm good with that. Yeah. yeah this is the one gift of COVID, right? Is the, the accessibility yeah. of the video conferencing. I'm so sure. great to see you and I feel so um, flattered and, and warmed that you wanted to talk to me at all. It's just, a, it's just so dreamy. So 